the Church of England was very active in uh, mission in a number of regions. Uh, this sets the stage for the global spread of Anglicanism and the Anglican Communion as we know it today. Uh, mission activity was uh, carried out by two different uh, wings of the Church of England. One was the Evangelical Wing, and we've uh, discussed Evangelicalism in, in uh, some detail before. Another was what we call the Anglo-Catholic Wing. That's a wing emerging out of the Oxford Movement that emphasizes um, the sacramental life and the um, connection of the Church of England with the apostolic traditions of the early church. Uh, so what we're going to discover then is the form of Anglicanism in Africa depends regionally on which uh, a group of Anglicans were doing the exporting of the gospel. So from the Anglo-Catholic camp, this activity is carried out by a group known as the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, known as SBG. There was also another smaller group known as the University Mission. Uh, what these missionaries do when they get to various contexts is emphasize a highly developed liturgical and sacramental life for people to immerse themselves in. So you will see um, images of, of local African Anglican communities in full um, liturgical dress with chasubles and uh, the full regalia that very much looks like what an Anglo-Catholic parish would look like. Uh, there is an emphasis on incarnation in the preaching, and then uh, that gets translated into a, uh, a concern and care for um, society as a whole. So it's very much a, a social gospel or a, a social incarnation of Christ, if you would, in mission. So you care for the soul and you care for the body. Uh, this is very hierarchical in its mission. It um, deemed that only priests could do missionary activity. So it has a hard time mobilizing local indigenous people to do the missionary activity until they themselves are ordained. Um, the uh, as, uh, uh, SPG is most active in West Africa and Ghana, and in Southern Africa and what is now South Africa. The other branch is uh, the evangelical branch of the Church of England, and this is epitomized in the Church Missionary Society, or CMS, which we mentioned in the previous video. Here the focus is uh, on the salvation of individuals, as you might guess from an evangelical perspective, and then an emphasis on personal conversion of individuals, and then their displays of personal holiness. And so there's less interest in liturgy and sacraments as kind of conveying the high point of the Christian life, and more a focus on the word of God as contained in scripture as the most necessary thing. Um, so what that's going to mean is a really heavy emphasis on um, literacy, conversion. But if you remember last week when we read uh, about Henry Venn, who is the head of the Church Missionary Society, a rapid deployment of the local population once converted into doing the missionary and pastoral work. So less hierarchical, in some ways much more flexible than the Anglo-Catholic branch. Uh, the evangelical spread uh, occurs in, in West Africa, in what we now would call Nigeria, uh, Central Africa in the region now of Uganda, and East Africa in what is now Kenya. And of course, then they spread out from there. But those are kind of three major camps we could be envisioning here. Um, one of the things that both groups of missionaries often discover uh, in their activity is that wherever they go, people have already heard about the gospel. People have already heard of Jesus Christ. They never go to a village and really feel like it's the first time anyone there has ever heard anything about Christianity. Um, and this is because uh, in traditional African societies, young men often um, trekked, traveled, sojourned outside of their, um, their uh, uh, societies. 
uh, as part of the rites of adulthood. You go exploring, you go in a way, it's a way of discovering it yourself. And it appears that it's these young men who cross different cultural and social boundaries often end up in contact with um, already established missionary zones. And when they return from their travels, they bring back word of what they've heard. And that includes hearing about Jesus. And so um, there's a quote by uh, uh, scholars of missionary studies, which is this, that the first missionary arriving in a certain African village there to proclaim for the first time the name of Christ was never first. So it's an interesting way of, of, of decentering um, the 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 image that it's solely the European or the American who brings the gospel to any one place, but rather there's already a complex cultural interchange happening, and Christianity is part of that interchange. A significant center for Anglican missionary activity was the establishment of Fora Bay college uh, by uh, CMS uh, in Sierra Leone. And this college is established um, really to educate those who've been liberated from slavery. And it ends up being this epicenter of educating West African leaders. And so um, it's nicknamed, the Fora Bay College still exists. Its nickname is the Athens of West Africa, this kind of key site of, of learning. Because Fora Bay College is set up to um, educate and empower local Africans, this becomes very useful um, as they move into leadership positions, especially because European missionaries uh, were often susceptible to uh, diseases in the tropical context where they were working that they had no natural immunities for. And so we discover that uh, in about a 50 year time period between 1843 and 1899, uh, we have about 112 native clergy, uh, those of African descent associated with the Church Missionary Society serving as pastors or catechists. So this is a key, a key strategy of the evangelical movement is to quickly empower people on the ground to do the work. One of the great um, paragons of that work is a figure known as Samuel Ajaye Crowther. Um, he is our first African Anglican bishop. He is a member of the people of Yoruba, uh, which is in contemporary Nigeria. He is uh, captured by uh, Muslim slave traders as a child. Uh, he's abducted. He's put on one of these slave ships. A British naval ship intercepts it, liberates the members on board, including Crowther, and then he is educated in Sierra Leone by the Church Missionary Society at Fora Bay College. He uh, is active in a trip that the CMS takes up the Niger River um, in, in the main region where the Yoruba people lived. This is in the year uh, 1841. On that trip, uh, there's 145 Europeans on that boat or a set of uh, steamboats going up the river. 40 of them die, which means that um, the African catechists and other workers who were along on the trip are quickly pressed into taking on important leadership positions. Uh, Crowther's capacities are quickly recognized. In 1843, he's ordained in London. Uh, and then he ministers in both Sierra Leone and what at that time was called Yoruba land, uh, which now we would call Nigeria. And so there he focuses on a very common Christian missionary uh, strategy, which is to convert chiefs. So we've gotten outside these zones of liberated, formerly enslaved people. And he's going into the interior to try to now convert uh, the leaders of the Yoruban people. Uh, he introduces uh, agrarian technologies like the corn mill, uh, forms of plowing, um, other um, resources that would boost uh, uh, agricultural production and thus boost the well-being of the people. 
he introduces that along with the gospel. So now we have another aspect of modernity at play here. Uh, technology not only benefiting missionaries, but technology benefiting the people who are being missionized. And the message is, the good news of Jesus Christ is tangible. It saves your soul, but also a, is accompanied by uh, material benefit. And this uh, speaks to a very common human assumption that how I believe tangibly improves my life. In 1857, the, the Niger mission is formally opened. Uh, this uh, employs both African uh, catechists and African teachers. Um, Crowther is very much a part of this. And then 1864, he's made the first African Anglican bishop. His title, given to him by uh, Queen Victoria, is Bishop of Western Equatorial Africa Beyond the Queen's Dominions. The Bishop of Western Equatorial Africa Beyond the Queen's Dominions, which gives you a real sense of both where he's located, right there in Western Africa, and outside of British imperial control itself. He has authority within the interior of Yoruba land, but only over um, African clergy, not European ones. But what's crucial is in 1867, three years after he's made bishop, Euro Europeans are expelled from the interior, and all work done in this region is done by Africans under the leadership of Bishop Crowther. Uh, when Church of England uh, clergy and missionaries are able to return in the 1880s, they uh, it's a whole new generation, um, very young men in their 20s, who um, have no real relationship with Crowther, and they go in and they critique the work he's done. They say that it is um, an inferior kind of Christianity. It's adapted to the culture too much. It's not authentic to the call of the gospel. And so they undermine Crowther and his authority. And this leads to a campaign against him which culminates in 1891 with Crowther being forced to resign by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Edward Benson. And so we have here a very complex story of both empowerment of Crowther to do work as the first bishop for uh, in Africa and a story, again, of uh, assumptions about race and cultural superiority and we also have these complex narratives of technology and gospel and material benefit all, all weaving together here. So I hope this story of Crowther helps you more concretely think about what mission looked like by Anglicans in Africa in the 19th century. It was a complex initiative. It was an initiative shared by many different people and a range of outcomes that we can assess. In our final video on Christianity in Africa in this time period, we'll be looking at an example of mission in Central Africa.